Good morning. Welcome to Palm City Presbyterian Church. Let's stand to our feet and let's worship together.
of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Home City Presbyterian Church. Please be seated. We are so glad you're here. Whether you're a member, a guest, a first-time guest, if you're a first-time guest, we have a gift for you. Be sure you get that, but we are glad that you're here today. Uh, God has called us together here for a special purpose. We are going to praise Him. We're going to open His Word together and pray that the Holy Spirit will move among us. It's an exciting day for our church. We're ordaining and installing some new deacons today. Uh, We have at least one in every service, and Judy Scott is going to be installed. She's already a deacon. She's going to be installed as a deacon uh, at this service at the end of the sermon today, and we are thankful for her service and uh, the others who are coming to be ordained and installed today. Just a few announcements for you. Our next new member class is August 8th. That's just a couple of weeks away. So if you've been thinking about joining the church, now is a good time. The next class will be in October after that. Uh, But it's going to be at noon. We have a lunch. You can sign up online or by calling the church office. Also, right around the corner even sooner, the youth are having their end-of-summer beach retreat August 2nd to 5th. Now, in past years, this has been called Camp Surf. They're still going to be doing some surfing, I understand, but a little bit different uh, this year. It is the end of summer beach retreat. There should be information about that uh, in the bulletin on, on our website. 
Grief Share Support Program is starting next month as well. We have two different uh, two different groups going. One is in the mornings on when, uh, Wednesday at 10 a.m. and then there's Tuesday at 6:30 in the library. And finally, this morning for our announcements, September isn't so far away, and September 9th is the beginning of a new year of community Bible study. CBS. Uh, they meet right here at Palm City Presbyterian Church. This year, they are going to study the book of the Revelation. They're going to swing for the fence. That's a deep one. And so uh, if you've ever wanted to know more about that, this is your opportunity starting September 9th with CBS. We always pray for the persecuted church, and our prayers today are for our brothers and sisters in Qatar, which is number 29 on the Open Doors World Watch list. It's a very interesting country because it is so oil-rich that most Qataris uh, maybe don't have to work. And so only 12% of the people who live there are actually citizens. The rest are foreign workers who have come in uh, to do all the things that they hired them to do. And life for Christians looks very different depending on whether you are a native or a foreigner. If you're a foreign worker, then you can be a Christian and there are some limited areas where you can go to worship and those kinds of things. Uh, Qataris are expected to be Muslim, and those who convert to Christianity face significant persecution uh, from family, from the community, from the government. So I want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Qatar this morning. Will you lift your hearts now to God in prayer? Oh Lord God, we confess we are not good at love. You created us for love so that would be, we would be loved perfectly by you, and we would love not infinitely, but perfectly. But we don't, Lord. We are broken, and we're not able to do that. In our better moments, we want to do that. We want to love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We want to love our neighbors as ourselves, but to be honest, our, our sin is such that even in our selfishness, we don't love ourselves the way we should. We not only need you to teach us love, you've done that. You've shown us what love is in the cross of Christ. We also need you to empower us to love. May your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, live within us and make us like you. Give us the power to love you as we should, to love one another, to love our neighbors, especially those who are lost and who are hurting. Love is a beautiful thing, Lord. It is, it is difficult for us. We know you understand that. We know the power of the gospel. We know your Holy Spirit power, and we pray that you would enable us to love. We thank you for our church, for the things that are happening, for new deacons, for youth and children's activities, for the grief share. Lord, there are people who need to know you. There are people who are grieving, people who are hurting. We pray that you would love them through this church. You would love our community. You would love our nation through this church. That you would love our world through our church, our ministry partners here and abroad. Show your love for our brothers and sisters in Qatar, Lord. Uphold that church and empower them to love their neighbors, even those who persecute them. And now, Lord, we come before you eager to love you, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. With thankful and generous hearts, let us give as our ushers come to receive our offering.
stand. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I opened my door and a, a smoothie and a wrap were sitting there outside the door. I had no idea what DoorDash was, but my wife had ordered a smoothie, and I had no idea at any time you could just ask for things to magically appear at your door, and here they are. It, this is a dangerous game, trust me. Um, our life is surrounded with people doing things for us. I didn't put my tires on last week. Uh, some mornings I don't make my coffee. There's a lot of things I don't do myself. Other people are much better at it. And I can imagine it'd be easy to think uh, I come to church and they worship for me. And I tell you this morning, we can sing the songs. I can't engage your heart. I can't give over your mind and your thoughts to him. So I challenge you this morning, don't miss the opportunity to sing to him and pray to him and worship him. Let's stand to our feet and sing one more song. we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill. we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
nation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a Our scripture reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and verses 25 through 30. Hear now God's word. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, so that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we conclude our sermon series on truth. And I want to tie all of the messages together. In the first sermon in this series, I argued that truth exists. Truth with a capital T. Many people today believe that truth is relative, especially in moral and spiritual matters. But we saw that because God exists, truth exists. Truth that you can build your life on exists. In the second sermon in the series, I explained why this truth is so hard to find. We are good at deceiving ourselves. Although God has given every human being enough truth so that we are without excuse, our sin blinds us to it. The last week, we heard that truth is personal, and you must make a personal commitment to it. Furthermore, truth is a person, Jesus Christ. He is the way, truth, and life. Today, we want to tie all of this together as we answer the question, how can I live a life that is true? Now, what do I mean by that? A life that is true. It's probably easier to show you than to explain it. In his book, Reflections on the Existence of God, Richard E. Simmons III shares the shocking ending to a debate between a Christian and an atheist over the question, does God exist? The Christian was William Lane Craig, one of the foremost defenders of the Christian faith in our day. William Lane Craig has a ministry called Reasonable Faith. 
There's a website by that name, and it has a lot of resources for Christians and for others who are seeking truth. One of the things he has done, uh, he has gone around the world and had many debates with atheists or intellectuals from other religions over such questions as, does God exist? And did Jesus rise from the dead? These debates are usually held on university campuses and draw large crowds. This particular debate was held at Arizona State University, and his opponent was Dr. Douglas Jessup from North Carolina State University. They squared off over the question, does God exist? And they argued back and forth for nearly an hour and a half. Both are good debaters, both made some good points, and the large group of students who had gathered to hear this debate was pretty evenly divided on the question. Until the very last question of the evening, they had opened the microphone up to questions from the students who were there, and a student asked them, can each of you tell us what difference your worldview makes to you in your own personal lives? And that's a good question, don't you think? That student was asking, are your beliefs livable? How are they working out for you? Dr. Craig, the Christian, described how he had never known meaning and hope until he became a Christian. He talked about how Jesus had transformed his heart and his mind, about the difference Jesus made in his marriage. And he said, when I became a Christian, I came to know joy for the first time. I can't help but want to share the wonder of Jesus Christ. I just can't keep him to myself. Then came Dr. Jessup's turn. And he admitted that if he had to share his hope with someone, he wouldn't have much to say. He said, I'd probably just go home, put on the Grateful Dead, and play chess with my computer. Simmons reports, after Professor Jessup made his remarks, it was dead silence. Then several students gasped as they understood, perhaps for the first time, that there is a connection between what one believes and the actual living of life. That's what I mean by a life that is true. A life that is true has two qualities. First, it corresponds to truth. Another way to say this is it is consistent with truth. For example, human beings are made in the image of God. That is true. And therefore, a life that is true avoids sexual immorality because that dishonors the image of God in the people and it also dishonors God in whose image they are made. Another example, Jesus is Lord. That's true. And therefore, if I want to live a life that is true, I must follow him. Everyone builds their life on what they think is true. If you're wrong, one of two things will happen. Either your life will show signs of stress, like a house that is built on a poor foundation. It will lean to one side. The walls will crack or maybe it will collapse entirely, like the house that was built on sand in Jesus' parable. In that parable, Jesus was talking about lives. He said that those who follow him, their life is like a house that's built on a rock. It's going to stand. Those who do not build their lives on truth, their house is built on sand. And it's going to fall. Now, the other thing that could happen when you are wrong is that you will live inconsistently with your beliefs. You say that you believe something, but you just can't live that way. Now, I've talked about this before. For example, many people say there are no moral absolutes, but they can't live that way. When someone wrongs them, they complain that it's unfair. 
and that is inconsistent. Because Christianity is true, is the only worldview that can be lived both successfully and consistently. Not that we Christians always do that, right? Because we certainly do not. But if we live consistent with the gospel, our lives will be good and beautiful. Our lives will demonstrate the truth of the gospel. They will be consistent. They will correspond to truth. Now, the, the second characteristic of a life that is true. A life that is true expresses the truth of God's glory. I said last week that the whole universe was created for Jesus. Everything is about him. God created to share his love and his glory with creatures who are like him. And so God, who is a person, created us human beings as persons. We're not robots. We're not merely animals, but we are made in God's image with the ability to know and delight in him. And we should, for he is worthy of our enjoyment. God is our highest good, our greatest beauty. He is infinitely holy and glorious. And we should look to him to find fulfillment in all of life. And all the blessings that God gives us, life and family and friends and romance and meaningful work, even a strong putting game, all those things are meant not merely to be enjoyed, but to point us to the one who gave them. God gives us life in this beautiful world. And we should say, wow, praise God for the wonders of creation. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have given me. And we share those blessings. Now that is a life that is true. Most people don't do that. Most people look around them and say, wow, look at this stuff. And this stuff could make me happy. If I worship this stuff by dedicating my life to it, I will be fulfilled. Now that is a life that is not true. Those who live true know that there is only one thing worth living for the glory of God. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When he says good works, I think he means more than acts of mercy and kindness. I think he means the whole flavor of your life. The way William Lane Craig's life impressed those students. Our scripture reading today is about a life that is true. Most of Paul's letters follow a simple pattern. He gives us truth, and then he tells us how to live it. Or if we want to sound impressive, we could say he begins with doctrine, and he moves to ethics. Most of the time, his letters follow this pattern, although the proportion varies. For example, the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters are all teaching, and the last five are application. In Ephesians, the letter our scripture reading comes from, there's more balance. In chapters 1 through 3, Paul describes what God has done for us. And in chapters 4 through 6, he tells how we live out this truth. And this basic pattern reminds us that truth must be lived. The gospel is true, and if you know it's true, your life should demonstrate its truth. Now, obviously, when I chose our scripture reading, I had to be selective because 
three chapters is too much to chew and swallow in one sermon. I chose the verses that I did because they give us the two main themes and also a very important point. And together, these two main themes and this important point give us a picture of a life well lived. I still think it's easier to show you than to explain, but Paul explains it to us. But as we hear him and listen to what he's saying, we should get a picture in our minds of a life well lived. So the two main themes are love and community. And we find these in verses 15 and 16, which say that speaking the truth in love, we should grow to Christ-like maturity. And as we do that, we are drawn together, we are bonded together, we work together so that the body, which means the body of Christ, the church, is built up in love. To put it plainly, a life that is true is a life in community a life sustained by relationships of mutual love. If you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you don't experience their love for you, then you're not living the truth. You may know the truth of the gospel, but you are not living the truth of the gospel. The Bible teaches that God created human beings to exist in a web of mutually loving relationships. God's love for us, our love for God, your love for others, their love for you, this mutually reinforcing web of loving relationships. And by the way, when we talk about love in this Christian sense, we mean a lot more than feelings. The Christian love it is not so much a feeling, it is how you treat other people. It is acting for their good. But the problem, you see, is that sin destroys this web. And worse than that, it, it breaks us, it corrupts us, so that we're not good at love. Our love tends to be tainted by selfishness. And this explains why our culture is so obsessed with romantic love. Most songs, most movies are about romantic love. People think if I have that relationship, then my need for love is fulfilled. You know, we've seen that people were created with a, a need for love. We need it. We're made for it. We crave it. But where do you find love in a broken and sinful world? Well, our culture puts all its eggs into the basket of romantic love because romance is exciting. Sex is powerful. And so people think, even if they don't consciously reason this out, but, but they think deep inside them. You know, if I just find that perfect person, then I'm going to be happy. My need for love will be fulfilled. But this is simply not true. Even if you find that ideal person, no human being can ever fulfill that need. It is a God-sized need. And so you see why so many relationships are temporary. But this also explains why the gospel and how the gospel sets us free. Once the grace of God claims you, once you experience God's love and you know the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, then your need is fulfilled. And you are free to love in an unselfish way. Because you don't have to grasp to fulfill that need anymore. And that should improve all your relationships, especially a romantic one. And yet the gospel also frees you not to need a romantic relationship. Our culture thinks you can't be fulfilled otherwise. But that's not true either. 
Jesus was the most complete, most fulfilled human being who ever lived, and he didn't have a romantic relationship. So the bottom line is, we need love. We need community. This is how we are made, and God wants this for us. And through the gospel, we can have that. This is how we live out the truth of the gospel. We live it out together. Now for the very important point. Great truth is always expressed in little habits. In verses 25 through 30, Paul gets down to the nitty-gritty. Now, he started this letter with great cosmic truths. So the very first thing he says in this letter is, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Wow, that's deep. In chapter 2, he talks about grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Wow, that is amazing. And then in chapter 4, Paul shifts gears and explains that we must live out these deep, amazing truths. Okay, so how do we do that? He says love and community. Okay, perfect. We can do that, right? Well, not so fast. Paul is worried that love and community is too general. And that we won't really be good at that unless he gives us some specific concrete instructions on how to live together in love and community. And so he tells us to tell the truth and to work with our hands and be generous, to be careful what we do with our anger, to choose our words carefully. Now, isn't this fascinating? We're given these great big truths, and then we ask, how can I live out these deep, powerful, amazing truths? And the answer we get is about honesty and self-control and hard work and generosity and using speech to build one another up. Great Truth is always expressed in little habits because our habits form our character and our character should demonstrate the truth of the gospel. Now be aware, this list of instructions in verses 25 through 30 is not exhaustive. The rest of Ephesians, the rest of the New Testament has a lot more to say about how we live out the great truths of the gospel. But there's a lot of fascinating things here in these few verses, and I wish I had time to go into all of them, but I do want to quickly hit a few points that I think you might wonder about. So verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. What does that mean? Anger is not sin. Anger is an emotion. Jesus got angry. He still does. What you do with your anger can be sin. In fact, anger leads very easily into sin, and that's why we have to be so careful with it. Paul also says not to let the sun go down on your anger, which means don't let it fester. We tend to do that. We hold on to our anger. We let it simmer till it boils over. Verse 29 warns against corrupting talk. Now, what does that mean? Well, this word translated corrupting in the original Greek is a very, very colorful word. When used of fish, it means rancid. When used of wood, it means rotten. When used of flowers, it means wilted. When used of lungs, it means diseased. And when used of a smell, 
refers to the putrid smell of death. So what is speech that is rancid, rotten, and wilted? Maybe the best way to understand that is to know what its opposite is. Its opposite is speech that builds up, speech that gives grace to others. So this corrupting talk means much more than dirty or inappropriate comments. It can include gossip or sowing seeds of dissension. Really, any kind of talk that denies the truth of the gospel. Finally, verse 30 warns us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? When we do not praise and thank God as we should, we live for ourselves instead of God. When we hurt one another, God grieves. The Holy Spirit is our life. He is our strength. If we want to live a life that is true, we must keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, that should be enough to chew on and digest. Do you want a life that is true? then live for the glory of God. Be like William Lane Craig when he said, I came to know joy for the first time. I can't help but want to share the wonder of Jesus Christ. I just can't keep him to myself.